everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Once again, I think we're skating on this rain tonight. I'm hoping. Uh, and we're going to have a fabulous show here tonight. I'd like to introduce some of the uh, different uh, vendors that are around. Right here to my right is Lemoyle Stargazers. If you have any kids, send them on over. They have an introduction to astronomy thing. And Neil will give you a whole spiel in the Stargazers. Uh, really interesting. If the sun comes out, you can look through their telescope at the sun and see possibly the sun, maybe some rings. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. New group in town, great to have them here. Back here, Harold Cross has set up a ping pong table. Join in the fun. All the way to my far back is River Arts. Woo, woo, woo. Their art tent, they've been here with us for a couple of years. It's always great to see. They have the art from last week hanging on their tent. Just, it's just such a creative community. It's very, very cool. The next one back is Healthy Lamoille Valley. Go on back. They have some games that they set up. Do you have kids here with you? Send them back. Let them go out and try some new things. Learn about what Healthy Lamoille Valley is doing in our community. These days, they are a big part of this community. Thank you for joining us. Over here to my left, uh, Tracy is setting up for Noise House Museum. They're doing bubble blowing again tonight. Uh, the next one is Danielle from Copley Hospital Wellness, Rise, Vermont. Uh, she has some interesting things. Uh, I think she told me something about ticks and about something else you could learn about in our community. Stop in and say hello to Danielle. And then Nepali. Woo woo! Thanks, Raymond, for coming. Thank you, Morrisville Fire Department Auxiliary, for coming. I have a couple other little notes. Tomorrow night at the Noise House Museum is our ice cream social. The Morrisville Community Band will be there. Uh, Noise House Museum, uh, Lower Main Street. You should join them, 6 p.m. It'll be a great event. Um, Morristown Parks and Recreation is putting on Bark in the Park this Saturday at 4 o'clock at the new dog park that's located at the Copley Avenue and Park Street. Bring your pooch along. They're going to have some gift bags. They're going to have some dog treats little training about dogs. I don't know if any of you have not been there, but if you got a pooch, it's a great new fenced-in dog park. Thank you to uh, Morristown Parks and Recreation. The other thing that they are doing is a mushroom foraging this Sunday at 1 o'clock. It is going to be up at, excuse me one minute, let me look at this, Beaver Meadow Trail in Morristown. Um, mushroom foraging adventure with Silvio. Uh, he will guide you through. They will be meeting at the parking area at the end of Beater Meadow Road off of Mud City Loop. That is a free event also. It's also put on by Morristown Parks and Recreation. That is something you do not have to sign up for, but you can just go ahead and just meet there at 1 o'clock, and they will be there to uh, greet you. The other thing I just wanted to, I don't know how many people in the community know, Francis Hill is the woman that usually comes around with the tip jar each week and says, hi, would you like to make a donation to the music series? It's always been uh, really great. This music series is almost solely put on with donations without taxpayer dollars. Very, very little taxpayer dollars goes into this. I am sad to announce that Francis fell down last week and broke her hip and is presently in Copley Hospital. She is that cute little woman that walks around town with her cart and helps out all different kinds of businesses. And I just want to do everyone to know, she will not be here. And if you would like to donate to the music series, the tip jar is over here on the table, and we would love to have you make a donation towards this series. This is, series is put on. Thank you to all of you. I really appreciate it, and the town of Morristown does. Also back here, all the way to the back, is Ian Noyes. He is representing Morristown Parks and Rec. He'll have a recreation event set up right back there, or you can play some ping pong with him. If you want to know more about what Morristown Parks and Rec is, you can talk to him or myself. We would, uh, Allison Link is all the way to the back. It's uh, up and running. It's been here about a year and a half. It's taken a while to get it up and going, but we've done some... Uh, really creative things in the community, and we're really looking for input from the community. If you uh, ever want to join in on the meeting or you have some thoughts and ideas about what you would like to see for new recreation in our community or how something could be better, reach out to us, you know? You all make community. We need to hear from you. We need to hear what you would like to see. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, 
Tom and Betsy Becker are here, my neighbors. They're from Maryland. They live across from me here. They're here. And my sweet husband has joined me for the first time here in uh, a long time. I just say, it's nice to have you. Thank you for joining us here. Um, so the band tonight, and so it's a brevity thing playing. It is Susan Schmidt will be, um, is, will be here with us too. She's a writer, a comic. Um, she's an organizer of the Moth Story Slam in Burlington. She is also a musician, and this is the band that she plays with, the Brevity Thing. This tonight is a partnership with River Arts. They are uh, sponsoring this combination happening tonight. Thank you, River Arts, for being part of Wednesday Night Live in a couple weeks. They'll also be having a, a creative arts night here to also bring out some of the other great art and um, musicians and things in our community. Let me think about what I'm forgetting here. I think that's it. Um, there will be a story slam here tonight, so get your brain thinking about it. Sue will tell you a little more about it when she gets up here on stage. Thank you all for coming. So welcome. We're so glad to be here with you tonight. Um, like we said, the band's going to play a little bit. Woo! Thank you, Dave, for that enthusiasm. Love it. Love it. Um, but at some point tonight, we are going to do a story slam, a community story slam. And so here's what that means. Anybody here that has a story about community is going to come up to the stage and is going to tell us their five to six minute story about community. And I can see that you're terrified. So let me just dispel a couple of myths. We're not going to grab you and drag you up on stage. It's completely voluntary. But I do want you to think about this theme of community. And while the band is playing and while you're getting food and you're getting settled, I want to pose this question. When was the first time you understood what community meant to you? And I want you to have that conversation with the people that you're sitting with. If you're married to the person you're here with and you're looking at them like, I don't, I've been trapped inside with you for the last year and a half, I don't really want to talk to you anymore, you might be surprised that they have some answer to that question you've never heard before. So take a risk. If you decide you want to tell a story, we've got some paper and pens up in this bag. Feel free to come up, take a piece of paper, write your name on it. More on that later. We'll see you soon. Somebody could have told me, somebody could have let me know what it was that went wrong. Somebody, somebody could have told me, somebody could have let me know what the hell was going on. But nobody, uh-uh, nobody said nothing. Now I'm out here on my own. It might not look like much. Oh. But this is how I pray. I don't fall on my knees. I don't look at the sky. I don't wonder why. All I do is this. All I want to hear is, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
It ain't nothing. It ain't no matter. It ain't no matter. You know why? I got all I need. This is my blood. This is my soul. This is the sound of it all coming around. It might not look like much. Oh, yeah. But this is how I pray. I don't fall on my knees. I don't look at the sky. I don't wonder why. All I do is listen. All I want to hear is, oh. Well, there's a heart that's broke 
taking on everything. We're getting it up. Sides up and we'll go all the way and start all over again. Well, well, I had murder rock a hundred and three. Grand place time for Belly. Told him down the no way and he had sin. I won't fall over the way and start all over again. I said, no more rain. No more roses. I'm on my way. Swing my spurs in a crew coupon. Sound of an angel. Ah. 
He didn't understand he wasn't from around here. He found a finger lying in the soup and he never realized one decision might lead to the next simple game of a rock, paper, scissors. Mm -hmm. But every time you lose, you lose a finger. There was not until he had but one left. He realized he could no longer make a scissor, leaving him for two options. But even paper starts to look like a rock because his avenue is a whittle away, and then the whittle away, and then the whittle away, and then they stop. Up to the next town. A little further away than the last. He just let his intuition got him and he started to make not one decision. Once again, he no, oh no. Another finger in his suit. Oh no. Another finger lying right there in his suit. As the waitress laughs and giggles and says, You know, honey, you know. What do you know? I never know. You know, they say. They say the Lord made you ugly and scared you too, but the rest, my son, is up to you. Good luck! The Lord made you ugly and scared you too, but the rest, my son, woo-hoo, is up to you. What that meant. He never heard that expression before. And he sees no connection between these things or anything really at all. Well, there must have been a time he could have turned around, but he don't remember at all. Yeah, there must have been a time he could have turned around, but he don't remember at all. A simple game of a rock, paper, scissors. Mm -hmm. But every time you lose, you lose a finger. There was not until he had but one left. He realized he could no longer make a scissor, leaving him but two options. But even paper starts to look like a rock because his avenues are whittled away, and then they whittle away, and then they whittle away, and then they stop. Tell me what the hell is going on. Tell me what the hell is going on. Tell me what the hell is going on. He has got to get the out of Dodge. He never felt so out of control as he does his best to ignore the waiter who's poking and saying, hey, buddy. You know who they say. They say living large, ain't living large, let's just walk among the guys, think about it now. Living large, ain't living large, Mr. Buck, woo, 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 among the guys. He thinks he can think thoughts that have no bearing upon this world. He thinks he can think thoughts that have no bearing upon this world. He never told anyone about the money, nobody, no, 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 no. He never told anyone about, about the money, money. nobody.
Thank you so much for having us. 
I just want to introduce everybody really quickly. I'll go first. I'm Steve. Steve Goldman, I'm the bass player. All the way on the end, we have Dr. John Hammock on the mandolin. He also wrote that last song. On the drums, you know her, you love her, Sue Schmidt. And saving the best for last, on guitar, Wait, what? the birthday boy, Mr. David Ball. And this song is for him.
we show as love. And I'm not sure but that might be all anybody needs. When I heard a voice singing soft and low, I knew deep in my bones it was going to be the day.
Have you been
Now the wind blows across the water Waves once tried feels green When the value of that property Measured by a farm machine Hallelujah to the sister Once who lived in that old home On the land baptized by water From the dam that made it flow Through the air and it flow Hallelujah to the sister Are you ready to hear some stories? Are you ready to tell some stories? That's really the question. So I have zero names in this bag right here. Zero people have signed up tonight to tell a story. None, zero none. So I'll just explain a little bit what's gonna happen here and maybe you'll change your mind. So um, I'm a producer for a thing called the Moth Radio Hour, which you can hear on National Public Radio. Woo, we got a Moth Radio fan. So some of you driving home, you hear a story, you're like, wow, that's a great story. I could never tell a great story like that. Well, here's a little bit of information. Every single person that you hear on the Moth Radio is somebody just like you that decided to get up, take a chance, and tell their story. So tonight, you are going to have that opportunity. So if you have a story about community, I'm not going to make it come up, but if you have a story about community, raise your hand. Come on. Nobody has a story about community? Okay. Are people, if you are alive, thank you, there's a hand. If you're alive on the planet, you have a story about community. I know you do. The question is, are you going to come up and tell it? So here's how this will work. If we get zero storytellers, the band will just play more. You'll eat your food, you'll drink your drink, you'll go home, you'll go into air conditioning, you'll fall asleep tonight, and you will say, darn it, I had a story. Why didn't I get up and tell it? Like this gal right here who is coming to the stage to tell a story about community. Now, before she gets up here, there's a couple of things that have to happen. She's going to tell a five to six minute story. When she gets to the five minute mark, we're going to make a little sound that lets her know that she's got a minute to finish up so that she's not up here for like 25 minutes. No, no, no. She's still coming up. The other thing that has to happen is the audience has to acknowledge that this is really hard. It's really hard to get up and tell a personal story in front of people. So what we're going to do is we are going to practice clapping her to the stage. Okay? What's your name? Mary. Mary? Okay, so before Mary comes up here, that was lame. I, I know it's hot. I'm hot. You're hot. Everybody's hot. But we are going to clap. We are going to clap. We are going to hoot. We are going to holler. And we are going to clap all the way until Mary gets up to the microphone to tell us her story about community. So here we go. Are we ready? Please welcome to the stage our very first storyteller of the night, Mary! because otherwise I can't remember it. It is my story, and I wrote it. So this happened to me. Okay, I'll tell it. Thank you all. Um, I don't usually come out to these things, but um, I thought it was time that I got off the hill after the year and a half that we've had with COVID. It's, it's nice to see neighbors again. So this is a true story. And if there are little girls out here about the age of, seven, eight, nine, ten. This story is for you. Proximity can be a dangerous thing. All that separated us 
from old Mrs. Clark's house was a driveway, a long fence harboring a thicket of unkempt vines and bushes, the Tim Burton-esque Nightmare on Russell Street, blood red colored garage, a rusted and blown out screened porch, deep green shades pulled down to the sills and never a murmur, a light, or a visitor. Mrs. Clark was our Boo Radley, and my family lived right next door. In all the years we lived on Russell Street, I never once saw her. The summer Mrs. Clark grandson came to visit was the chance I'd hoped for, but it wasn't to be. Christopher was his name. He had a willowy grace, cool clothes, and thin long hair that made me think of British pop stars of the early 1970s. The first time I saw Chris Clark, he was sitting on the front steps of his grandmother's house, surveying the neighborhood. I was frightened for him, thinking he wandered onto our street and had either a death wish or unknowingly picked the wrong house to park himself at while he got his bearings. That wasn't the case. Chris Clark was here for the summer, and his grandmother, Mrs. Clark, was his caretaker. He was cute, polite, artistic, and athletic. He was 13. I was 11. In other words, he was the perfect male model for my pre-adolescent boyfriend dreams. Naturally, I claimed him first. In our neighborhood, adjacent lots created a de facto pecking order and gave whichever girl lived closest to whichever boy first dibs on his attentions. Kathleen, Lynn, and all my other girlfriends understood. With Chris Clark, I had territorial rights. I began the courtship process immediately and in earnest, such as it was. He joined our after-school queue and would hang out with us discussing music, playing stickball, doing curb wheelies on his Schwinn, and sneaking cigarettes in the Verschereau's barn with the rest of us. Chris seemed normal considering he lived with his grandmother, and nobody ever saw or spoke to her. Not even the mailman, nor the paperboy, not even Mr. Eno, the old grocer who made neighborhood deliveries straight out of his decked out 1949 Chevy truck. He would leave a grocery bag on the front porch steps each week and it would mysteriously disappear inside, never when anyone was looking. Chris would not retrieve it either. I know, I watched from my bedroom window as long as I could stand to lie stealthily motionless. As soon as it seemed as my concentration would ebb, I would look back and the groceries would be gone. I realized soon enough it wasn't as enamored, I wasn't as enamored of Chris as I was with getting inside that house. He never spoke of his grandmother or his parents. I'd been taught not to ask those kinds of questions, so it didn't come up. All I knew was that he was an only child, no one visited him here, and he seemed content to meld with our group. As often as he found his way in and out of our homes, no one was ever invited inside his grandmother's house. Even the front porch steps were off limits. We walked around them, never directly in front of them. It was our version of the DMZ. At night, Chris would disappear behind the heavy door and my heart would seize up momentarily at the thought of his angelic form fading away behind Lucifer's gate. Each morning, however, he would reappear, his 70s cool, as intact as any of the rest of us, his reluctance, his reluctance to talk about his grandmother or family became part of the myth and mystery of her. Soon enough, it just didn't seem important to ask about it. Chris had become part of the street where we all lived, and that's as far as it would ever go. The summer after Chris Clark moved away, we went back to our old ways of tormenting the elderly Mrs. Clark, sending someone over the fence to climb her chestnut tree and shake it loose of all the chestnuts, which we would string into Wilma Flintstone-sized necklaces or peg, peg at each other in mock fights. When we sent Rudy, easily the smallest kid in our gang of thieves, into Mrs. Clark's yard for more chestnuts, he lost his footing, toppled out of the thick branches, and broke both arms as he braced himself for the fall. Not a single one of us had the guts to climb over the fence to retrieve him. He lay there in agony while we all stood at the fence, waiting for the ambulance to arrive, petrified that he'd be claimed by our elderly neighbor and swallowed into that spooky house never to be heard from again. Rudy and his story of survival from the fall from Mrs. Clark's chestnut tree, both arms and cast, became the story of the summer. And with each telling, the story became darker, more menacing, and more thrilling to the point where all of us girls, regardless of the fact that Rudy was a full four inches shorter than any of us, developed a crush on him. Our memories of his considerable bravery and stoic endurance while he lay helplessly in Mrs. Clark's yard were a strong aphrodisiac. 
Eventually, even the infatuation with Rudy's bravery faded too. Both arms healed just fine, and the only girl left with a crush on him was shorter than he was. Chris Clark would not return to live among us. We moved away the summer I turned 14, and old Mrs. Clark never once came out of her house. Thank you. Give it up for Mary. That was really brave. Thank you, Mary. Mary gets a little sticker that says, I told, and I'm not afraid to do it again. All right. So now the band, minus me, because I'm tired and my brain needs to stop for a second, is going to play a song to go along with Mary's story. Let's see how they do. You guys got something? You got something? Okay. Here we go. got a story. Anybody got a story about community? I got another storyteller. Yay! Okay, now remember, it hasn't been that long since the last one, so you should remember what you're doing. What's your name? 
Bill, give it up for Bill. Let me hear it. Come on. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. So, my wife and I live here in Morristown. It's always funny to me that there's a, such a, a dis distinction between the town and the village. Uh, we moved here in 2013, and we have a nice little place down off Lawrence Farm Road. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do when we were here were to get involved with a local church, and I had been an Episcopalian, Episcopalian and um, I think I'm up then. Um, so I went to St. John's in Stowe. And the rector there was very much of an activist. And so what I'm gonna talk about is homelessness and a community around it. So in uh, 2017, in, in the winter, uh, which started early, um, his idea was that we really needed shelter so people didn't have to sleep in their cars. And there are government programs that help with that, but there are people who are left out. And so I had been at, their, been at the church for a while and I had become the senior warden who was sort of the person in charge of the money. So the rector called me one night in, in that December and he said, Bill, it's so cold, I can't stand it. I want to use our church as a place for people to come. So we did. I didn't have any problem with that because he had been talking about it for a long time. So how did we do it? Well, the first thing we did was um, decide that we would just use the uh, what's called the undercroft, uh, essentially the basement of the church where we have meetings and other kinds of things, and put, put beds in there for people to uh, spend the night. And so, luckily enough, my wife, who's sitting over there, Elaine, I was standing up now, um, had been a, a member of the Red Cross for some time, and in fact was a Lamoille captain for the um, for that. Anyway, um, so she was able to call up some people in Burlington and got about a dozen or so um, cots. People were donating banquet, uh, banquet, uh, <laughs> blankets, um, and. Uh, the first night, there was only one person who came in. She never came back. We started getting referrals from the agencies, most of whom are here in Morrisville. And so they were sending people. Within a week, we had about a dozen people staying overnight. They had to come at about 5 o'clock in the evening and leave about 8 o'clock in the morning. Our promise to them was they would have a warm place to sleep, they would have supper, and they would have breakfast. And then they had to go back to their cars or wherever else they were living. Seeing a family living in a car is kind of a hard thing to do. It's, it kind of moves you when you're involved with that. So, um, one of the things we had to do was to figure out how to manage, and that's where my wife came in. She had all these forms for the, from the, um, whoops. Well, I've forgotten what it's called. Anyway, um, so we got that, and we started keeping track of people, so we would know who came in, who came out, how many people had been there for a long time. But then big things cropped up, like on the second day. Well, where's the food gonna come from? Who's gonna do all the cleaning during the day before 
after people leave and before they come back. And all of a sudden, people came from everywhere, from as far as Ard Hardwick and Johnson. And there were several churches that got involved and sent their people here to our ch church. And so it was becoming a success. And then the, the county sheriff, sheriff um, stepped in and said, look, I've got this yellow house there. It's empty. Let's use that. And it was much more spacious than what we could do. And so we started moving it there. Now, uh, the agency that governs this yellow house, as it's called, it's in Hyde Park, um, is here in, in Lamoille. And they manage things in terms of all the stuff that we had had to do in the first weeks. Um, and they're doing pretty well. You probably see things about them in the newspaper from time to time. So I'm not going to go the whole five minutes, but I want to end with a line from a poem by Robert Frost about the hired hand. The hired hand was someone who had worked for this particular family on their farm and had gotten sick and had gone away. And then one snowy night, he ended up at the house again. And so Frost goes on talking about why this group of people in their family are helping this man. And why did he choose them? And the reason that he chose them is a definition that Robert Frost gives. Home is where, where you have no place else to go. They have to take you in. That's it. Bill, 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 thank you. One more time for Bill. Woo! All right, the band's going to play a song. Who's next? Who's on deck for storytelling? Come on, there's somebody in here. I'm going to pull a pro. I'm going to pull a pro. Our next storyteller's stage is going to be Kevin Gallagher, who you might know that name. He's a two-time Moth Grand Slam champion, and he's here. He's here right now, and he's going to tell a story right after this.
guess I'm already there I come home She lifted up the wings I guess that this must be the place Let's just say about it the better Did I find you or you find me There was a time Before we were born If someone asked This is where I'll be didn't understand. When I was young, I didn't know about hurt and a healing. When I was young, I never thought it would go. Now I'm grown, and things not exactly what they see. Think about God. And I wonder, does she 
think about me Okay, it's your turn to participate, you ready? Jack's already here, so it's gonna be short, but it's gonna be excited. Give it up for Jack! Come on! There it is. Thank you. This uh, poem's a combination of experience from my uncle and myself. Uh, the title of this, the essay and poem is called Verde Oscuro, um, which means deep green in Spanish. <clears throat> I am at the market in Central Square. It is a windy Saturday mid-morning and the market is already busy with groups of shoppers looking for produce, handmade goods, leather jackets, boots, and sweets, anything and everything. I am looking for something handmade. The cheap, cheap stuff is from China or Vietnam, somewhere far away. The beautiful, imperfect things are made by old hands, abuela or a tia grande. The best are on nietos of viejos, but sometimes someone grows too quickly or passes away before the thing knitted with love just for them is complete. These rare items end up here in the central market. The sound of the market surges around me as I go from stall or cart to stall or cart. The sellers call out their wares to each other with news, a call aqui, or a call aca, or a call aqui again. The rushes of noise punctuated by the exclamations slicing through them. The seasonal market peaks with, these, with those things needed for the upcoming months. It ebbs with the uh, items for the months just passing. Tio Aaron brought my cream sweater, winter sweater from this market when I was little. He and Abuela Rosa left here when he was two and Abuela was young and beautiful. Tio came here through his long life to visit the market and he would bring back the rare items to us that lived away, away away across the ocean, and I still have my treasure, my long outgrown, take it out to trace the knots and patterns, my sweater. Each knot is a blessing, I think, a child, or a wedding, or a season, or a passing. Rosa and Aaron came by boat with little but memories and hope. My mama came 13 years later, and on and then, on that new shore, I, 30 years later still, abuela, tío, mama, and me, we lived by the ocean. I grew up there connected by water and waves to a place far away. I go back every year for the blessing, the blessing of memory. Now, as a viejo myself, I come to the market for a rare item. The second half of this is a poem either in Spanish or English. I'm gonna read the English version of it. Last week, I bought a new sweater. I looked for a sweater that was dark green, verde oscuro. I saw that color in the ocean when I was a small child. I heard the seagulls, they return each year. The skulls eat the shoreside crabs and I study the sea, I study the waves. They come in, they go out. I pass my time there, I play with the seashells. I believe in the water and the sand and I return with the goals each year. The, the sea lends me space. Coming back, I read the wind and the waters. I thought that the deep water was the color of dark green and I looked for a sweater of the color of the deep water. Uh, 
a, a man sold me this from a stall in the central market, and I came back home and thought of the sea. Volví a casa y pensé en la mar, el mar. So, thank you, gracias. Okay, because we didn't get to clap him all the way up from his seat, I want us to clap him all the way back to his seat. One more time, thank you so much. Woo! Fabulous. All right, the band seems to not be ready. I think they're kind of thinking more about food than they are about playing. So, more storytellers, yes? Do we have a storyteller? I see someone coming. Does everybody know who this is? This is Lisa from River Arts, who put this whole thing together, who made this happen, and are, you're coming to tell a story, right? All the way to the stage. Come on, clap her up. Let's go. Thanks. So I kept hoping that I would have time to actually like write something down and prepare this because I'd been talking to Sue and talking about community and what does that mean and how do you tell a story about that and um, when we were thinking about the idea of this story slam I was thinking well we've had a whole year of isolation how do we bring people together how do we make our community whole again and I'm, I'm fairly new to this community I'm actually kind of a transplant from Michigan so I thought I'd tell a story about my friend Paul from my, my community in Michigan that I have come from um, the first time I met Paul, I had found a farm. I was driving between a job in northern Michigan and an artist residency in Nebraska, a weird place. And I found a farm in southern Michigan, and it said, oh, we have a music festival. If you wanted to volunteer, you can help out with this music festival. And I was like, that sounds fun. I could do that for two months. And so I show up at this farm, and Paul is one of the farmhands that summer, and he rolls up on this like rickety bike at the driveway, I remember pulling in, and he was like carrying a tent on his back, and he was like, I'm gonna go sleep out in the field because the deer keep eating the vegetables. So that's just kind of a, a preface. Paul was like an incredibly weird, connected guy. He was like, the, the plants have feelings. Let me tell you about how there's this weird science where trees are communicating through their microrhizomes, like really into science, really into community. And when I showed up, the farmers at the property had said, well, Paul has just written this blog post. You should read this blog post. It tells Paul's story. And he had been a uh, finance student at UVM. He was working in a bank and he went out to lunch one day, and he was coming back to lunch, there was a guy sitting in the parking lot, homeless, and he sat down next to the guy in the parking lot, and he ended up having this two hour long conversation with this guy. And the guy had, like, was food instable, and Paul was talking about how he really loved organic vegetables, and how could we make the, a community garden happen? So two hours pass, obviously, Paul did not get back from lunch on time. He walks back into his office and he quit. He walked out and he started a community garden in outside of um, Detroit. And so he had really like, awesome ideas about how do we bring people together about food, how do we bring people together through music, and like just a like bigger than life personality. He, I remember one summer we were running the music festival. I ended up going back a year after year. We were running the kids tent together and he had this huge sombrero on that he had dangled little bracelets off of that he was making. And I remember he came up to me and he gave me a friendship bracelet and he's like, look, because you're my friend, and then pranced away. And we ended up dancing all night. He had no shoes on. The bottoms of his feet were black. So a couple years later, I was actually out in California. He called me up one day and he's like, I hear you're in California. And I was like, yes. And he's like, I heard that you were hiking, and I am also hiking. And we ended up having a 25-mile gap between us. We ended up finding each other multiple times throughout the United States, randomly. So the last time I saw Paul was in 2016. He'd come to my house, and 
it was a, I had had like a potluck. I was living and working on a outdoor education center where there was 12 acres of snowy fields. And he decided we should go snowing, like we should go sledding out in the fields. So we ended up spending the majority of the day finding mushrooms. Cause he said, oh look, there are mushrooms growing on all the trees. So we had our sleds and we kept collecting these frozen oyster mushrooms. And we took them home and we ended up having this really weird and maybe not delicious, but good foraged food. Um, that was December, I think it was December 12th. And on December 16th, Paul died of an enlarged heart. His heart erupted at our friend's skating rink. And we all came together the next summer at the next music festival. And we had a memorial for Paul because he knew, he knew everyone there. He had brought a lot of people to the music festival. There was a community of people from Northern Michigan who ran another music festival that he had connected us to. There was a family, a homeschool community that he had connected us to. There was his huge farmer community from the Detroit area from his urban farming project that he had brought us to. He even had hiker friends from California who had been hiking the Pacific Crest Trail with him who came to the music festival. And there was this moment where I had written a song and I was playing it and it was about Paul and we had this like group cry, you know, about double the amount of people here crying together over a person that we all loved. And so when I think about community, I think about that vulnerability, that you can share something, you can love people, you can reach out and make connections and, and find comfort in really hard times, even in the presence of loss. So that is what community means to me. And I'm so happy to have joined this community and found that here. Thank you. Lisa! Oh my gosh! One more time for Lisa. Wow. I think that's a perfect way to end our first Community Story Slam. Yeah? So the band's going to play out for a few more minutes. Vendors are here. Thank you so much again to River Arts for having us. Thank you for you guys for showing up and sticking through the rain. It might rain a little bit more, but we're tough, right? Thank you. He might be gone, but there's one to be drunk still. Come on in, sitting on the back porch, drinking red wine. All right, we're drinking red wine. My good friend Gregory has picked up his arch top. It's got five rusty strings and one shiny new one. He likes it that way. I believe I know why. Cause when he starts to sing, he'll call the hops of the blessed. And though we don't know the words, though we sure know the feel. I said we know the feel. We're all just mumbling in time.
on the 219. I said, hey, hey. smaller as you get farther away. The rug covers everything you wanted to say. Was that a raindrop in the corner of your eye? Were you trying your nails or waving goodbye? I said, hey, hey, I don't know what to do. tonight. We have been really excited to be here. We want to give a big um, thank you to Pete who is doing all of our sounds tonight and without Pete we just sound like we're playing in our basement. So thank you so much Pete. We're going to end on a cautionary tale for you all.